Colony special broadcast. It is uh, a hangout today with Costa Macreas and Hollis Polk. They are the leaders of ET Let's Talk, which is a CE5 um, geared group where which means that they go and they do quantitative collection of contact with extraterrestrials as well as doing it through a spiritual way but also doing it with you know anything that you can use as far as cameras or telescopes or anything that would allow them to collect data they have more than 6000 members in more than 60 countries that coordinate events and they go out uh, on the same night across the world and then they collect this information so it's quite a new concept for us at Human Colony because we are not actually doing it in that manner but we're here to learn everything about it I'd like to introduce everyone that's in the room with us today we have Alex, Johannes, Michelle, Sabrina and myself Karen Newman and we also have Costa and Hollis so I'd like to welcome you to this hangout and thank you so much for being here with us and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank so, you. Uh, we, we appreciate you uh, having another conversation with us um, on video this time and presenting yeah. to the audience. Yeah, thanks for having us. So Costa, why don't you start and, and, and I, you all always work really well together speaking but why don't you sort of tell us your background, you know, how you got into this, what is CE5, just start at the beginning and, and we'll all listen. And um, Okay, um, we, yeah, we all have a story how we got here um, and, and I wanted just to update people that our community has grown over the past year, the ET Let's Talk community. We're now at about 11,000 members in I believe about 100 countries. So there's a lot of, clear. clearly there's a lot of interest in the topic and we're really happy to have have been growing and are going to continue to do that. Um, so I, if you rewind my life, there was a time in the 60s and 70s where I grew up and um, I was born in the United States um, in Indiana, the, the, the heart of the Midwest there. And as a young man, uh, I was part of the times of the 60s, especially when NASA was doing the Gemini Apollo programs uh, those were the days when our imaginations were fired up and captured by uh, what we were told about the space program. And I know there's some controversy and uh, of NASA about that now, but I but I have to say, from what we knew as young children and saw on our TVs, it was really cool. Um, it captivated the headlines. Someone like me also had interest in astronomy and science fiction, um, everything to do with space. And then Star Trek came along. So what I'm trying to set is the context of the times that I, in which I grew up, uh, the, again, the 60s as, as a small child and, and a teenager, if uh, you were me, you were just all agog over the skies and the opportunities to go to the stars and to read about it and to take your telescope out. Well, along the way, um, don't really remember the age, but it might have been eight, might have been nine, might, might have been ten years old, I picked up my first UFO book. And I was captivated by that, and, and I read everything that I could that was available back then. Now, in the early 60s, and especially in that part of the country, you didn't have, obviously, the Internet and the, the great availability of books on the topic. But, again, I read what I could, fascinated, wanted to know more, wanted to meet, wanted to see UFOs, etc. Um, that didn't happen, but the seed was planted. And that's important because of where I am now. Fast forward with my life, I got a degree in computer science in college, got a job, uh, came out to California, the West Coast, got married, had two children, divorced, remarried to Hollis here. And then in 2006, I sat down and uh, realizing I had the Internet, one afternoon I thought to myself, I wonder what's going on in the UFO field. You know, I, I uh, have some time now, and, and at this stage in my life, I want to explore again. Well, I, I found uh, the Disclosure Project at the time, which had a lot of witnesses from the government and other corporate areas talking about uh, suddenly ET, retrieval teams, and how this had been covered up for years. And again, my imagination was fired up, and, and that's how that part began. I decided to go to a week-long retreat, a training, um, here in Mount Shasta, which is about four hours from, from our home in the San Francisco Bay Area, because I wanted to see what I could see under the, under the skies. 
I have to admit I was fearful and very excited at the same time. If you can imagine that fifth grade, ten-year-old kind of kid who doesn't know what to expect, and because Hollywood has so played the evil alien thing that that has ruined it for a lot of us, um, there was that element of fear, but still excitement and knowing like there's no way I can't go. I told Hollis this, and she was she was really supportive of me going, but basically said to me, you know, um, I know they're here, I believe in these civilizations and they're visiting, but I don't see how they affect my daily life. So go, have a good time, I support you, and let me know what you see. So that was a cool agreement, and with that kind of support, I could really just, just enjoy my time there. It was during that week that we were going out under the stars and learning about uh, ET that changed my life and brought me to here. The, the major incident was uh, one night uh, after meditation of 40 of us in the field at the base of Mount Shasta. We had a, half, a for half an hour, we had a sphere suddenly, not suddenly, but slowly materialize, like you would see in a movie, something fading in, in front of you. Like, for me, it was about six, seven feet away, and it floated above the ground. We were in a clearing with the forest, and after I rubbed my eyes a lot, and looked at it and determined it wasn't the moonlight or the shadows playing tricks on my eyes. I was fascinated. And I was in the company at that point of nine other people, eight or nine, I, I didn't really count, but a group. We all saw the same thing. We watched this sphere silently, without vibration, smell, or anything else, just hanging there. Uh, we knew something was going on, and this was up, up close and personal. Um, it lasted for half an hour. Uh, there's another story I can tell later on if you want to know about uh, our communication uh, that one of us had with the beings inside. But suffice it to say that um, after that half hour, it slowly faded out, and many of us were never the same. Uh, this was something that you, we could not deny. We were totally sober, straight, awake, alert. It was also cold that night, you know, so you were very alert. Um, and we all saw it, and there was quite a buzz, and I, I knew right then and there that I was. I had just taken a deep dive back into this subject because when you have that experience and you know that it's yours, it's not someone else's experience, even secondhand of somebody that you might trust. When it's yours, then you go, "Oh my God!" You know what else is there? Um, I didn't really even try that hard. I'd like more of this, etc. So um, bringing Hollis into this now, um, I, that did change my life and I wanted to do more and I'll, I can describe more of you know, what happened after that. But it was my habit during that week to, to call Hollis back here at our home every morning and tell her what I had seen the previous night and I was just really excited about what was happening in the sky, on the ground and the things I was learning and, and knowing that I was making genuine contact because we were being taught how to identify the, the normal kind of phenomenon, planes, weather, balloons, um, etc. And when you eliminated all that, I was seeing actual things and I was telling Hollis about them. About the fourth or fifth morning, uh, when I picked up the phone and to start talking her ear off again, you know, about what I was seeing, she stopped me and said, wait a minute, I've got a story for you. And I, and I thought, what? What's going on? I'm the one with all the stories. <laughs> you know, what happened? And I'll let her tell the story now of, of what was going on here. Okay, so I should probably back up and say that when I was a little kid, I was totally fascinated by the space program, um, yeah, listening to all the radio things, having scrapbooks, like, fascinated. But not remotely interested in astronomy, uh, not remotely interested in science fiction. I mean, not remotely. I read one book. I read A Wrinkle in Time. Like, that was it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I love that book. So that that affected me very deeply. That book, actually, me too. Yeah. But it's the only one I read. So anyway, it's perfect um, one to read. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and and the thing is that the space program affected me so much that I actually became an engineer. So you know, I have an engineering degree from Princeton, and then it, it, kind of a long story what happened. But I have a Harvard MBA, so I kind of got out of engineering and. Believe me, was this was not remotely interesting to me. You know, like Costa said, when he went up to Mount Shasta, um, I was like, have a good time, you know. Um, 
but uh, it doesn't do anything for me. So I was at home, and uh, one night, and again, it was the fourth or fifth night, um, I was reading in bed, and I turned out the light. You know, you reach over, you turn out the light, and you, you know how you kind of have to scooch down in bed to go to sleep? Well, I turned around to scooch down in bed, and there were these, like, four little beings standing around the foot of the bed looking at me. Um, they were translucent, white, bipedal, um, slightly large head, three and a half to four feet tall. I couldn't um, see features at all. But there was um, there was this like love coming off them, like just exuding love, like just they were all love. And so I could not be remotely afraid, but I was shocked. Like for once in my life, my mind went blank. Really blank. That never happens. And that, they, right, that doesn't happen to me. Oh, somebody's saying they had the same experience. That's great. Um, I did. Okay, okay. And then, um, so we'll have to talk about the beings. Anyway. Have my um, people call your people. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, so after, like, I recovered, it might have been a minute or so, which is a really long time to be completely blank, um, I thought, oh, I should ask them something. And, funny. And um, so I thought, all I could think of is, where are you from? Right? Not the best question, but it's all I could think of is, where are you from? And very slowly in my mind, this word formed, which I'll, it came like this. It came, Arcturus. And I'd never heard of that, at least not consciously. Okay? So it's possible that I had heard it somewhere. Um, you know, and you know how we, there's a lot in our subconscious minds that we're not aware of consciously. So this one, you know, I, ha I got to say, it's possible I had heard of it, but I certainly had no conscious knowledge of it. So the next morning when Costa called and I told him the story, I said, is that a place? And, you know, he went, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's Astronomy 101. It's yeah. the Arcturian star system. I believe it's a red giant or a red super giant. Big, big, big star. <laughs> I don't know. She got the big one right off the bat, yeah. Yeah, yeah, she got she got the great prize. Well, I mean, who? That's just who showed up. Yeah. So. And she said they were very sweet, and they were um, looking at her yeah. very quizzically and saying, "Oh yeah, who are you? Right? Or who are you? Right? That was right. actually what came telepathically first was, "Who are you? Aww. It was like really sweet. Who are you? You know? And so there was nothing to be afraid of, and it was like. And again, my mind went blank, so I'm sure they got who I was without me having to tell them, you know. And and anyway, so after a while, after a few minutes, they just sort of faded away. We we theorized that because of the connections I was making in Mount Shasta, four hours, four or five hours away, daily and deeply, they may, must have followed my energy. Because I was talking to her every day, and obviously because we were married, we were, we were close. We just figured they followed my energy link back to our home to her, and that's kind of where the who are you question came from. Hey, this guy's spending a lot of time talking to this woman, you know, what's up? You know, and so they showed up. Yeah, yeah. And But what's really powerful about this is that as Hollis finished that story, and I'm kind of like pulling my jaw up off the floor, because I did not expect to hear something like this at all. She says to me next year about the, the retreat. Next year, I'm coming with you. It's personal now. So okay. <laughs> now it affects my life. No, right? affects. they're here. Like yeah. they're really here. Well, so. it, isn't it interesting? I mean, the, the contact was made visually by people who say maybe are not psychically expecting to have to tune into something. And you, because Hollis is a psychic and a medium, you know. I'm not they, a good medium. Not reliable as a medium. I'm a good psychic. They're okay, just like great psychic, and that's the rule. Yeah. All psychics are not mediums, and all mediums, but all mediums are psychic. Right. But anyway, she's a psychic, and they connected to her in a way that would, you know, grab your interest and and you know. Right, I mean, because it was with my eyes. It wasn't clairvoyant. If it had been a clairvoyant thing, mm -hmm. um, I would have said, oh, well, like, okay, that's nice. I had contact from something. I don't know what it is. 
um, you know, I mean, I have guides, and I see images of them internally, but it's the still to this day the only time I've ever physically seen something with my eyes that were clearly beams. Right, right. So this was different. Yeah. And as for me, because I don't have a clairvoyant vision inner or outer, it was important for me to to jog my interest in this again to see something with my physical eyes within the range of perception that I have. And I didn't even the company of a bunch of other people so that I did not walk away later after that if I had I been alone. Second guess myself and say, okay, I'm I'm crazy or something happened. No, I was with other people, so I think the setting, the environment, the circumstances were all perfect for what I needed to really validate that experience uh, based on what I can see and to jog that interest and get me going. At, at the end of the, that week, I decided because I wanted more, um, I would start organizing people and I asked for emails uh, to start doing uh, these CE5 meditations um, on a more regular basis. And that started what is now the, the etletstalk.com community of 11,000 people. And I'm, I'm happy to say that that's what it took, and I will never forget that experience. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because, in a way, they showed you also the way that they can be contacted, whether it's through psychic connection or through actual visual manifestation. So not only did they reach out to you in both ways, but they, you know, they brought together your two talents that you have that allowed you to realize that this was something that could be yeah. brought forward in that way. Would you be able to tell us exactly what is the CE5 uh, contact sure. protocol? It's what is it based in? It yeah. stands for uh, um, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. Um, off the top of my head, I can't recite what Close Encounters of the First through Fourth Kind are, but many of us are familiar with Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the movie, and that true to its name, was um, an actual sighting and, and a, um, a non-human initiated, in a way, uh, contact. What makes the CE5, the, the fifth kind, uh, special is that it's human initiated, for starters, and there are different techniques that people can use when they get together and say, I want to have a contact, rather than with the other four types of CEs, uh, close encounters, uh, where you just wait and maybe hope or you're not expecting and something happens, we deliberately do this. And that's what all our teams are about across the world is, is synchronizing at times and, and at other times doing our own things to initiate the encounter and start an interaction. The whole idea is uh, let's talk. And that's where ET Let's Talk, thanks to Hollis uh, coming up with that, um, that phrase, uh, which I liked very much because it sounds like kind of what we're doing here where you're sitting around you know in a virtual living room just talking in an informal way with someone we, we felt that ET Let's Talk conveyed that same idea of of a friendly reaching out and and conversation with ET to do a CE5 and Hollis can also help me with this um, from her experience is um, something that can be done by a single person often it's better in a group People just like company, and I hear that all the time in the community when people write me, as I do a lot of networking, is, you know, is there someone near me? Is there a group near me? I'm all alone. My family thinks I'm crazy. My spouse thinks I'm crazy. Nobody wants to listen. I like to find company. So I really want to emphasize that if any of you out there in our audience feel like that, come to etletstalk.com because the whole idea is this is about a community that is supportive of our experiences. We've not all had the same experiences. There's there's a whole continuum, but at least uh, I've tried to make the community a safe place where we can talk about what has happened to us with sympathetic people and learn from each other and teach each other. That's what a community does. This is kind of crowdsourcing ET contact. So uh, the actual protocols I tell you, up on the website, etletstalk.com, under CE5 protocols, I've written seven steps of instruction, which involve meditation, uh, circulating energy in the group from heart to heart, visualizing a beam of light going from the center of your virtual group circle into space as kind of a beacon, 
as well as connecting your group with all the other groups on the planet even if they're not joining in it doesn't have to be time synchronized but connecting them in a network so that the field of the CE5 is really strengthened by everybody who's joining in and 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 adding their energies to it month after month day after day year after year and we're now in our uh, sixth year of doing this global CE5 initiative which which I founded in October of 2010 making our monthly uh, contact on Saturdays that are nearest the full moon with all our teams. Each team, it seems, will take those seven instructions and kind of customize. I, uh, I, um, I emphasize the, the core of what those are should be that people participating in the contact who, who want this positive contact need to approach it with an attitude of goodwill towards our benevolent star friends of an open mind, an open heart, sincerity, and inviting them to come in. That serves to raise one's personal vibration as well as, as the group does it together in, in a meditation, raises the group's vibration. And these spiritual civilizations, these ET intelligences, will pick up on that frequency. They've told us that. And, and they love the joy, the laughter, the group cohesiveness, the, the coherent group thought that's part of the CE5 experience. That's it in a nutshell, kind of just in a real informal way. Like I said, the, there's instructions which uh, kind of fill out what I was just saying here, but, but basically that's it. It's, it's your intention that we believe really, really sets the tone for whether you're going to make contact and, and how. I mean, I'll let Hollis here, she has some experience with, um, with, uh, with CE5. You know, your, your, your approach is uh, you've been in the group with us as much as as much as anyone has had. Has okay, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what you're asking, but um, you know we've had a variety of experiences. The you know all the flavors of lights in the sky. Um, we've also had. Uh, I can I'm thinking of one time in particular when we're doing our meditation or slightly after the meditation, and I could feel to my right because we're outside, we're sitting in a huge circle. You know, there's a couple feet between each person, and I could feel like a warmth. It was a cold night, and I could feel a warmth, maybe a foot or so to my right. And so I took out my hands, and you know, I don't know if anybody has done this, if you've ever um, felt your own aura or somebody else's, if you um, rub your hands together. A lot of people like to do it literally skin on skin. I don't, but if you move your hands like this, and you can you can feel your own aura. And then you can start to feel, yeah, if you want to try it now, feel free. Like, go for it. Um, and um, then you can feel, you know, somebody next to you's aura. Anyway, so I had people doing that. And people came over and people could actually, everybody else could feel this being too. So that was one sort of manifestation. And that's what I want to emphasize. Uh, it's not just about the lights in the sky. As, as exciting as that continues to be for many of us you know when you see a an anomalous light or several of them zigzagging pulsing um, when you send them a thought maybe flaring forth and phasing in and out for you as a, as a means of bi-directional communication that all that all remains exciting because you realize they're intelligently piloted it's not just uh, some random abstract thing out there 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 are beings there that are aware of us and want to communicate in whatever way that our perceptions will allow. So yeah, the lights in the sky are great, but what Hollis was just describing also is important. There are nights when we can't go out under the stars, you know, for, for weather purposes, uh, obviously. So we do meditations indoors, and it's totally possible, and, and has actually happened, that ET beings will join us in our circle and different people will be able to perceive them. You know, Hollis gave you just one example now of being able to feel them. Other people will feel waves of love. They'll feel a presence looking at them. Later, when we compare stories after the meditation, we'll realize one or two or three people saw the same thing silently as they compare. So we validate each other that way. We're not just, not just uh, being totally woo-woo and, and out of our bodies. We, we talk about the, um, the experiences and, and share and, and it's kind of like the blind man with the elephant. Sometimes there will be a being in the room, but each person has gotten a different sense of it. 
but once you talk and realize you were having the same experience but just seeing it from your own perspective or through your own filters, that's really validating for a group and validating for yourself that you really did experience something and that you as the group created a field where you could have a common experience. That's really powerful because the CE5 really is all about consciousness uh, in reaching out and in doing the communication and in doing it in a sincere way. And you have to be ready for the, the results to come in many different ways. I know we have had um, smartphones turn on by themselves. Oh, wow. Well. Nice. You know, and, it, and, and they'll turn on right after meditation with a song that's related to star people or something that's in the playlist, and it'll start playing. That's one example. I could come up with uh, lights in the house, uh, our cars, um, other electronic devices like radar detectors, uh, chirping out in the middle of nowhere where there, there is no signal, you know, 50 miles from nowhere. The stories keep going on and on as I listen to what people from uh, our team, our 11,000 members, send to us every month, you wouldn't believe what they come up with that you never thought of from flyovers of their house of actual craft that they can see with the shape and lights and all that mm -hmm. to, to other experiences in the ground of having a visit like Hollis did in their room and a telepathic communication as well. They capture some of this on, on video uh, with pictures and, and that's what's exciting about our community is, is we're gathering that evidence. Right. We don't have the, like a scientific study and, and quantify it in the way that we would like I just meant quantifiable as, as a meaning as actually volume of the, the actual volume of data. The fact that if you have 11,000 people in, in 100 countries, 110 countries, I'm sorry I shortchanged you on how many you had. But, no, 100 is fine. Yeah. <laughs> but if you have that continually, repeti rep uh, repetitively over time, that's a and you know, if you have all this data over now six years, it's pretty impressive to anyone who would want to look at it. So when I say quantifiable, I mean more or quantitative. I meant more as a sheer volume of material. Um, but yeah, that's really that's really something. There's a couple of questions that maybe you can address because they're in line with what you were saying. Um, okay. One of the the questions that was really just nice was just that can we do this? Because we have these hangouts all the time where people from Human Colony hang out. Could we do this in a hangout like we're doing it now? Um, or do we all need to be together? Um, do the people need to be in the same room? Or Yeah. Okay, no, we actually used to have a Skype group. Okay. okay I'm, getting, I'm getting a little weird echo. Oh, that's me. Let me, let me mute my mic real quick. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we used to have a Skype group. We were here. LA, Texas, Toronto. Toronto, and every now and then somebody else would show up. So yes, different countries are fine. And we would meditate together. Like we'd have a little chat and then we'd meditate together. And we definitely had anomalous phenomena, uh, sound phenomena show up. And then afterwards, sometimes after the meditation, we'd be talking about something that happened and something would chirp, like in a scent. Like, oh yes, that happened. And that happened right, like pretty much every time we meditated together, there were these electronic sound phenomena that happened. And not only electronic, but in the meditation, each person in their location could feel the presence of a being, for example, or they, they saw a light moving in the room. So it wasn't just what might be coming through the computer. And I know people will say, oh, that was uh, noise on the speakers. Not so. We Over years that we were doing this, and using Skype for other reasons, uh, for example, Hollis had a radio show at, at one point and was always on Skype, you know, uh, with an audience. Never had um, anomalous uh, d uh, problems like a dissonant noise yeah. and all that. And yet, when we would get on and do these ET meditations with each other, sure shooting every every time, uh, different kinds of sounds would come through, and so we knew that uh, there wasn't the equipment as well as people had their own personal experiences too. Well, okay, and I don't know, maybe a month or so ago, this is related, um, Klaus and I were doing Jimmy Church on Skype, and we heard those beeps. Like, they were there. It, it was, was awesome. It was the same ones we yeah. always worked with, yeah. yeah. And I, we know what they were saying, they were probably modulating the signals in a way that 
I suppose if we had the means to record them and try to find, do some research, we could find some kind of communication, but we're not able to do that. And yet it was always still a thrill to know that they would respond to words and sentences and, and, and send us chirps and different kinds of noises to indicate that there was an intelligent listening in of what we're saying and an understanding of what we were saying. So, so the answer, the short answer is yes, uh, Google Hangouts is being used. In fact, in my etletstalk.com community, there's a gentleman by the name of Thomas Courtholm, a uh, wonderful man who does have a Google Hangout for our uh, monthly CE5 uh, global, global CE5 initiative get-togethers. Um, if someone wants to write to me, and I can put you in contact with Thomas um, to, to participate in, in his Google Hangout, or, you know, do your own. Yeah, it's totally possible. And you know what? If you have friends all over the world, uh, why not use the technology we have like this to, to have company and right, to share in this? Yeah, we, we, we'll definitely write to you because I think that might be a nice future hangout for us to do or participate in. Um, there's some other questions that if, you, if you're willing to take them. Um, one thing I want to say about the chirping, I had uh, together with Roxanne Swainhart, who's another person who's in Human Colony and a good friend of mine, we were doing some studies on Course in Miracles. We were getting together every week and doing Course in Miracles studies and we had all of a sudden this sort of electronic voice that started coming through because we were doing it via Skype and we could hear it, but Roxy couldn't. And um, my friend Crystal and I were like, can you hear that? And, and finally this voice goes, can you hear me? Like that. And <laughs> we were saying, we were saying, is this an, you know, we were like, is this an extra try? So if you are, speak up, you know, and then we heard this, can you hear me? It was really, really cool. I have it. I have a little uh, minute and a half clip of it. I'll, I can send it to you, but it's pretty impressive. So, um, why don't we? I'll, I'll let uh, if uh, Michelle can ask her questions, followed by Sabrina. And if anyone has a question, please put it in the chat, and we'll just go through these questions really quick. Go ahead, Sabrina. Did you mean Michelle? <laughs> I didn't mean that. Yes. Okay. Hi. Um, so I was really curious if this phenomenon only happened. Um, like, does this happen for everybody in your community after you guys meditate together with that intention? Because you said we have all these different kinds of phenomenon that happen. And so I was thinking, so is it every time, like, is it only when you do the meditation, like, on purpose? Like, if you watch, like, I've watched Stephen Greer, and they all get together, and they all collectively watch a thing happen, you know? And then... Mm -hmm. So, or does it just start happening for everybody on, after that on its own also? You know, it's all of the above. Uh, with so many people out there doing this, th th there really is quite the range of times, situations where they get the contact. And, and that's the good thing, the good news, because sometimes if you, if you do a group, say do a group meditation and maybe nothing happens right away, but a few hours later, even after people leave, say you're home, suddenly you make contact in the house, you know, then that counts. I mean, that's part of the, the intention that you set. There's times when groups will go out in the field and start setting, just by the time they start setting up their chairs and getting settled in, and already someone's pointing at the sky and going, there they are, and they're making contact already. Then they'll still go into meditation. I believe that once a group has gotten together with a, a pure intent, the ETs have gotten your energy signature. They know the group vibration, and that makes it possible for them to still connect with you, even though maybe you didn't formally sit down and start meditating yet, or maybe you had an off night. And that's not to say that every time you try to make over contact that you're going to be successful. Right. I, I want to tell people that, but I think over time, you, you set up the pattern, set up the rhythm, and that's really important. And they will pick up your vibration. So I want to encourage people to, to keep the faith with that. Uh, sometimes with someone who's new will have something right away. Sometimes someone takes several times. Um, and again, you have to watch out for how it can happen. You know, be aware of your surroundings and your perceptions. You might have a telepathic message. You might have a lucid dream. Or an ET. That, that happens with people. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've had, the thing that's cool about a group having a experience at the same time is like 
I had a little dude show up. <laughs> so, and but I'm the only one who saw it, you know. So, or I go outside and I I look at the stars, and then suddenly they start doing this amazing, beautiful dance, and I'm like, what? But I'm the only one looking at it. So. <laughs> So, I mean, it's neat to have a community, that, like, with the same intention at the same time, yeah. kind of, you know, experiencing yeah. that. No, I, I understand what you're saying. People who do it solo have ex experienced the same kind of frustration. I mean, it's an exhilaration. Like, I really did see that. But it's nice to get another validation. Um, that's why I, I encourage people to try to find a group if you can. On etletstalk.com, we have a a member map. People can join for free on the website. We have the, our CE5 reports there and people making posts and, and sharing. But the map is is there for people to look at and find people in their area. So I encourage people to become a free member there. Uh, contact me by creating a support ticket to give me their location and contact info and I'll put a, a marker on the map for them so that other people can find them if, if it's a group they want. I also encourage people, even if there's um, nobody near you, just to reach out like proactively to other people on the map because they've also proactively asked to be there, so they're very likely to answer you. And right. what's really cool is you can make friends at a distance, and you just never know when someone on the other side of the world knows somebody who's in your city that's interested in this, and they introduce you to them. I've had that happen over and over. So it just it just pays to put yourself on the map, reach out to people, and just start the talking, start the conversation, put it out there that you want to meet people that are close by. Because there's nothing like getting together physically. I mean, mm -hmm. doing what we're doing now is, is cool. It's better than nothing you know, before the Internet existed that we, that we had. But also being in the same room face-to-face -face is, is very empowering. And, and what I just mentioned uh, by using the map is just a good means to, to try to find people near you. Will do. Thank you. Sabrina. Hello. <clears throat> Hi. Um, okay. I mean, I've, I've had, I think I've seen like three of them. Um, and actually, just from my from my uh, kitchen window, which was convenient for me. <laughs> um, but I had tried that, what, what you had mentioned, because I had gone to to, uh, to Gria's website before, and actually I'm a member of your website. Um, well, thank you. So my question was more specifically um, about languages. Um, I'm sure you've seen that there's, you know, a lot of people speaking languages out there, and uh, that they e that they say it's ET languages. I don't I don't know if you're aware of this. Um, and Not much. oh, okay. So me in particular, I started speaking languages out of nowhere. Um, I didn't know, you know, I wasn't into any of this at that point. I was only meditating, um, so I wasn't into any of this. I was just meditating to help me relax and whatever at that point. And then I started getting languages. And um, at this point, I think I'd spoken about 15 languages. Wow. Mm. Are they recognizable? They're not earth languages is what you're saying there. Right. I'm, they're not they're, Yeah, they're not earth languages. Um, do you have an internal translation? Like do you know what they mean? Sometimes I do, sometimes I most of the time I don't. I can't set an intention and I do say when I said the intention. Um and so that's why I wanted to know if any if this happened to to anyone. I mean, it took me it took me a long time because I had them now for about I think it's going eight nine years. Um, so I don't know anybody that has had it uh, an auditorial phenomenon, but I did meet a woman once who gave me 
like, I don't even know how to explain it, writing that was not any kind of earth characters. It was a kind of calligraphy. Um, and I still have it. So she was given that. She didn't know what it meant either. But she, you know, was writing stuff that she was guided to write and clearly nothing from earth. Yeah. We, yeah. we have, just to tell you, and, and is we have quite a few people here, including myself, that speak galactic languages. I've spoken it since I was about 15 years old. Wow. Um, it's wow. about very distinctive uh, language um, and many of us do that. Um, Valerie who's here, she gets and some other people, I think Michelle as well, get uh, tons of channeled um, writing that is Valerie writes very very fast. I don't know Valerie if you have anything you can maybe grab and turn on your, your... I think you got me confused. With I'm sorry else. Wendy, I'm thinking yeah. of Wendy. Sorry, Wendy. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I don't do that yet. Also, I mean, I have writing. Sorry. I have. Go ahead. I have about three different kinds of writing. Yeah. Um, so, and Sabrina, you also have pictures. Oh yeah, and I also draw ETs. Yeah, we sort of get the information sort of channeled through us, and um, so. so so what happened? We didn't was, know if that was a phenomenon that's happening within the groups of the people that you are dealing with um, yeah. as well. We tend to focus on that because that's the kind of contact that we get. Mm -hmm. um, but, that, but the reason that we were so interested to talk to you is because you're approaching it from, say, even broader standpoint. That So we'd like to maybe incorporate that as well to even broaden um, our, own, our own experiences as well. And, and also expand our community and contact with people. That's, that's the other, yeah. the other so thing. I I'm really curious, um, for those of you who are getting this information, like if you're, are you hearing it and then speaking it, or does it just kind of come channeled out your mouth, or how, how does that work? It comes out of my mouth. I, I, get, I, get, uh, I get also meaning behind it. I can un also understand other people's languages and interpret them. Um, Sabrina, I don't know, she, I can't speak for her or anybody else, but that's how it happens with me. Sabrina, you want to yeah. chime in? I'm curious. Um, for for the languages, um, it they were actually you know at the beginning, at the beginning it was weird because I I didn't know what to make of it. Um, hold on a second, and and uh, and actually what ended up happening was that little by little many of us started getting the languages. Um. Mm -hmm. So my main language, I know it's Arcturian. Um, Sabrina, um, can you speak just a little so they can hear it? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. <clears throat> With my hoarse voice, but yeah. Um, it, that tends to be a more high pitch, but it's... Uh, so that's that's Arcturian and Lyran it's 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 a bit stronger it's um um it's that's Laren. What did you say in both of those cases? Um, I know that the first one, it's, I, I know it was like welcome and, you know, I'm glad I'm introducing you to the languages kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, so then there's Palladian, there's, there's many. Um, but the interesting thing was that it spread through the group as wildfire. Uh huh. Um, so so many people in the community speak the languages. Um, you know, they have at least one or two language that they speak. So your so, your community, it sounds like, um, is very focused on on the languages, um, which yeah. is which is interesting to me because. Um, I might run into, and I haven't, or, or Hollis, you know, w one person here or there 
who says that out of all the other range of experiences that people have, but you seem to have like a, a not a focus, but a conglomeration of people that can do all this. And it's fascinating to all, all of us. And of course, yeah, we always um, what's can, being I, said. can I add that Sarah also has a gift and she is here. Mm -hmm. She wants to yeah. come forward. Hello there. Hi. Hello. Hey. This is Sarah. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> um, well, I can see that this is an introduction to you, and we didn't really want to scare you so much um, because we we're not scared. In the group. Yes, I understand. Um, I do something, it's called toning. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, I definitely know a bunch of people who do that. Yeah. Okay. It's basically toning to the frequency of the perfect health of the being, or yeah. as much as they will allow. Mm -hmm. And it's not just humans. It's Hello? We lost her for a second. Um, she's going to say it's not just humans, but the earth, the energies, the planets, the sky, the moon. And the outdoor. Um, we only have about 15 minutes, so I want to get back to your stories because we only have you for another 15 minutes. Okay. But we would happily invite you to come and, and listen to our languages and uh, to, um, you know, participate in that way. It's, it's just, you know, every group, I think what's important that I would like to emphasize is that every group, there's so many groups out there, and the more that we sort of, you know, connect to each other, the more the total phenomena can benefit. Um, yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, this has sort of been the focus that we've had. I, I have to say, like, I spoke a language since I was 15. I didn't know anybody other than people going to church that were speaking languages. Um, and, and I actually came in contact with Mary Roswell. She's a woman in Australia, a psychologist who started mm -hmm. recording these languages. I connected with her and was able to you know, share that experience. But she just, she just collects the data. She doesn't really do a lot with it other than report that it's a phenomenon that's going on. So, and that's but, really valuable to do that. Mm -hmm. She's done a, a valuable service. Yeah, exactly. So, But to you guys, I know you had a... Um, you just did a big retreat in August. Yes. And you had some pretty amazing things that happened there. Do you want to? And do you have another one coming up, or are you yeah, going to? We will. And I'll be some you have the next year. The Hollis is next year. I'll join you, kind of. Uh, oh, she's been joining me. Seventh or eighth. We've lost track. Yeah. yeah, we will have another one coming up in Manchester, and I'll be announcing that uh, to the community sometime early this week. Right. Particulars of that. Uh, so I, but I need to get people's email addresses to do that, and so I'm okay. all about email addresses because that's the internet. If we can't be connected in that way or on social media, then we can't get the last of information. Well, what is your email address? And I'll put it here in the chat, and people can and you can say it out loud. Well, two things. I was go to, go to each. I'm getting an echo. Um, is that me? Can I do anything no, about it's that? probably. Oh, okay. I'll try to talk through it. Um, that's a little bit better. Uh, for yeah, just become a free member on etletstalk.com, and that way I'll record your email address, and you'll be on the list where I make all the announcements about my webinars, about retreats, um, about our monthly CE5 events, etc., etc., etc. People can also write to me at uh, Costa, K O S T A at etletstalk.com and I'll do my best to answer you in a timely timely manner. I correspond with hundreds of people every month and it's a real joy but it uh, means sometimes I'm a little delayed getting back to people but I do try because I really value everybody that's in the community. Um, I think, did I answer your question? Yes, you did. So. But tell us, did you want to talk about your retreat that you did? Or? Oh, right. Yeah, last August, about 28 of us got together for three and for some four days at Mount Shasta again. A really magical, powerful place. Uh, we've seen ET craft going in and out of that mountain. Um, we've had people remote view and go inside, and there's life and activity there. 
And we've had, and especially this last August, we had a lot of sky, lights in the sky phenomenon, um, as well as some, some ground-based phenomenon, phenomenon again, uh, in terms of what we've already described, the, the kinds of things that we see. It was a really great group, cohesive experience. Uh, many of the people, or some of the people, didn't know each other, but everybody knew me because as the organizer, I was doing matchmaker and thinking, you know, this person needs to come, this person needs to meet, and things like that. And it turned out really well. We, and, and that's part of this experience, too, is the joy of a group, of being friends, of sharing, breaking bread together, um, having community sharing, and then going out and doing the, the group CE5 contact. That's only enhanced once people get together and hopefully like each other and become friends. And that's what that retreat was like. Just a real high-energy, beautiful experience, and I want to repeat it. And like I said, I'll, I'll be sending out announcements about that uh, to, to people who are signed up on the website. Um, Hollis has, I'll let Hollis tell an interesting story now about leading a meditation during the retreat. You know, we like to have serious fun and sometimes things happen. Um, what I'm going to do while she's doing that is off to the side, plug in the power to, my, just looking at that. to my laptop. Wow, really well. I had no idea. I started out at 100% really at the top of the hour. I'm down to 20. So I had no idea that the, the power is that it takes to, to do this. So pardon me while I go off camera and you'll hear a little bit of clicking, but I'll, I'll okay, be right back. Okay. So really, this isn't anything extraterrestrial, um, and sometimes synchronicities are kind of funny. Um, so, you know, I start doing the meditation, getting everybody down, you know, take a deep breath, you know, all that stuff, and I get about maybe two minutes into it, and I hear somebody across the circle, and, you know, there's... I don't know, 28 people, so it's a pretty big circle. You know, everybody's a couple feet away, and I hear somebody across the circle scream. I mean, like, really, like, ah! And, and then the next part, and then, like, almost instantly, somebody else goes, oh, my God! And then I hear, ch -ch -ch -ch, and then I start to get wet. The sprinkler, the lawn sprinklers have gone off. And the thing is, nobody, um, we got there in the dark, we set up in the dark, we had no idea. So, you know, it, it, it goes down there, yeah, in, in the annals of the most, most fun I ever had? I don't know. The weirdest meditation I ever did. <laughs> Maybe your energy turned on the sprinklers. You never know. I, I think it was a timing thing. And still, you know, synchronicities, we had meant to start at whatever, to, like when it got dark and it took longer for people to set up. And so, you know, in a way there are no accidents. Well, you know, and as funny as it sounds, even when something goes wrong like that and gets everybody laughing, you know, as you're getting soaked and wet and someone's running to try to find where the control system is and turn the thing off, and that took several minutes, so we were getting wet out there, we were running away. It really still builds a, a great group bond, you know, so this is not all always about just serious meditation where there's no room for, uh, for joy, for laughter. Again, it builds a group bond and gets everybody talking and energized, and then we went back into the meditation, <laughs> finished that, and, and had another great night of contact. So so we didn't kind of we didn't miss a beat. And and I'm sure that among you there there's stories that you can tell where something uh, um, happened that you didn't expect that caused you just to stop, sit back and maybe laugh or look at something a little bit differently and not take yourselves uh, as seriously. Um, I always try to do that, you know, and uh, see the humor in things. Even while we're while we're doing serious work, I call it serious fun. Um, and what I want to what I want to emphasize is one thing I want to mention before we um, we leave is the people's disclosure movement. Yeah. Because the Let's Talk community is part of that. Um, I founded that at the same time a few years ago that I founded etletstalk.com in October of 2010. It includes anybody who's a person who's doing what you all are doing, groups like yours that we may not know of, doing similar things as well as our community, all to the um, the end of being our own disclosers, where we're not waiting for any government to make an official announcement telling us, hey, they're here, start believing now. Are you kidding me? We've been here and doing and believing and seeing our own uh, for years. So the People's Disclosure Movement is, is those of us who are becoming our own authorities and taking our power back from the governments because what have the governments done? They've, they've hidden things, they've covered up, 
They've lied. They manipulated. They made us sound like we're crazies for believing this, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a means of taking our power back. And I want, would love for your people here to, to start talking in terms of, hey, I'm part of the People's Disclosure Movement. Uh, no matter if you're just alone sitting in a living room making contact or whether you have a group of thousands, you know, you're still contributing to that field and raising the awareness around the world so that I really believe someday we will have made so many contacts and the ETs will be in the sky so much that a tipping point will be reached where nobody anywhere, no authority structure can tell any of us in any country of the world, you didn't see that, go back to sleep, it doesn't exist. Um, they won't be able to deny the evidence. And, and as a matter of fact, I'll, I'll close with this part, which is when I started the um, ET Let's Talk community, um, I did have some contact with ET Intelligence and some brief requests that they made uh, as I was considering, well, what do I do with, do I, how do I build a community? Is it important? Is it going to have any effect? Um, I was asked to build as many ET contact teams as possible, as soon as possible, in as many places as possible. That was very plain. And the reason is because by doing that, we give our star friends more human permission to show up in our lives and in our skies because they will not violate our free will to a certain extent, to a large extent. And as we continue to give them that permission, they, they told me that they would show up in more places. That means that more humans would then see them and ask to see more. And it becomes a virtuous circle. That's the phrase they use, a virtuous circle. And that's how that tipping point will then be reached. Enough of us doing this in, in enough countries um, in great numbers will just uh, fill the experience as part of our human field and nobody, will, nobody will be able to deny it. That's the people's disclosure. That's how that happens. We're the ones we've been waiting for. Well, I, I will say to you that, um, first of all, we thank you so very much because every one of us here is very committed to this happening, this disclosure. Um, we all believe it, whether we've had personal experiences or not. We're all quite convinced that this is this is the truth and that, you know, we know that it does take that tipping point. And one of the questions we've been asking internally is, what does it take to get there? And Sabrina is very much, I'll speak for her for a second, she's really, really pushing. She wants that tipping point and in her meditations, she's really shaking her finger at the universe saying, you know, come on already. So, and a lot of, a lot of us are as well. So first I want to thank you for the work that you're doing because in my opinion, I've shared this with you and it is the most important work of our time. Um, this banding together of people, standing up for what we believe, what we know, in in spite of all of the, not putting too much attention on that, but in spite of everything else, and just standing forward and saying this is this is what we want. So um, we're very grateful that you were here today. We'd like to have you back. We'll, maybe we'll try some stuff on our own and, and um, join in. Why don't you tell us, because you do uh, CE5 uh, events once a month, People right. Go ahead. Let me. I don't want to say it for you. It's the um, usually I, I publish the list, and again, if someone's a, becomes a free member on ntlexpot.com, I know I don't fit in that, but no, of course, that's your, that's we would love to do it. You'll be you'll be on the mailing list uh, once a month on a Saturday that's closest to the new moon, so that we can have a, a darker sky. Uh, people will join during a 24-hour period with all their brothers and sisters virtually across the planet. Um, any time of day that they can during that 24-hour period. And that way, uh, I believe our network is a representative of humanity at that point. You know, united for those 24 hours, we come forward and we're showing ET that not all of us are crazy or trying to shoot them down or murder each other. There is a peaceful contingent of human beings growing all the time that is ready to become cosmic humanity. And so we're there inviting them as a group representing humanity uh, to join and co-create the future with us. And I'll leave you with one more phrase. I like to say that the best way to uh, predict the future, you know, that we want a better future, right, for all, the best way to predict it is to create it. And that's what we're all about, co-creating with DT and with each other. 
Well, that's a beautiful way to end. We we usually end in this very special way here at Human Colony. We always ask our host to give us a blessing as we go out. So maybe you can give a blessing as to your hope and, and maybe draw from your meditation. If, if Hollis wants to join in, we would really appreciate it. And we will say to you, thank you and namaste for your contribution today. So I'll, I'll leave it with you. Yeah, and I want to say thank you to everyone who's joined in. It, it's special to be able to meet with like minds like this and to share our experiences. We learned something here about the languages and all that. So, mm -hmm. And I hope that you all learned something from our experience. And, and that's really what community is about. No one person has the one piece of the jigsaw. We all have little pieces and they make a complete picture. And that's what we're about. So what I wish for all of us is the blessing of community. And that's not only our human community as we get together, but also as we join with um, our cosmic friends and family, and that's what they call us. They're our elder brothers and sisters. That's how they want to be known, not as gods. And so that's what I wish for all of us, is continuing work to bring about the day when we more openly work with each other and, and bring a golden age of Earth in manifestation together. And I wish for everybody to share love and light and peace with each other and all of humanity and all of our star brothers and sisters. Namaste. Thank you so much. Namaste. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. And we will talk to you again in the next possible moment. So thank you so okay. very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.